to the panel. Part-time writer and full-time role. And the purpose of this is to find out where do you find time to write when you have life going on? It's a good question. Um, I will let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Lindsay Smith, and I'm the author of Secret, which is a young adult historical paranormal sci-fi fantasy thriller that just came out. Um, it's about psychic spies in Soviet Russia. And I also work full time. I work in foreign affairs. Lots going on there right now. So I um, fight this balance daily. Hello, my name is Jean Marie Ward. I write fiction, nonfiction, everything in between. Lately, my fiction output has been a large number of short stories, including a couple for these people. And, um, but, and, oh, please come to her booth, but we, <laughs> we will do that. Uh, I worked for years in the Department of Defense, uh, both in public affairs and in the family policy arena. And even after I didn't have to do that full time anymore, life intrudes. <laughs> Um, I'm Janine Spenlove, and I am the. I have written the War of the Seasons trilogy, and I'm also in a ton of short story anthologies. I think total last year I had seven different books come out. One was a novel, and then six were different anthologies, um, which still I don't know where I found the time for that. Um, because for my full time job, in addition to being a mom and a wife, I'm also a United States Marine active duty. Um, currently stationed here in Washington, D.C. at the House of Representatives, so they definitely keep me on my toes. And, uh, yeah, so on to... Okay, my name is Ron Garner, and I, uh, I run a uh, small press called uh, Silence in the Library Publishing. I also write, though, unfortunately, uh, my output, I, I wish I could say my output was as great as, uh, as these other panelists that I, that I was putting out as, as much volume or as good of a, a work, but... Uh, I, uh, I do that, and I am now a uh, reserve marine officer who was active duty until just a short time ago. He was also a panel crasher. <laughs> and I am a panel crasher. I'm an invited panel. Kind of panel crasher. So, I guess the first question everyone wants to ask, where do you find the time, how do you find the time to write when obviously you have such a busy life? Do you have some kind of structure? Do you do you um, schedule your day, or do you just, well, I'm going to write, and I'm going to find the time somehow? Um, definitely you have to claim that time for yourself, because it's not going to happen on its own if you don't make the time. Um, for me, a big part of my day is figuring out what do I need to accomplish within a given day, and that can be everything from what meetings I have to go to at work, you know, if I have a paper to write for grad school, any other life obligations, but then also, okay, what am I on deadline for? Do I have line edits coming up, or do I have a new draft that I have to complete? And just finding a way to balance those out across, usually I look at it from week to week instead of day to day, because day to day it gets a little too overwhelming. Yeah, it can get overwhelming. In a weird way, working full time gives you a structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that from X to Y, five days a week, not including three-day weekends, you are going to be stuck. Now, if you've got a job like these ladies do and like I used to have, there are swell times when, forget it, you're not writing. Uh, but working for the government, you can largely decide, well, this part of the day is going to my job every day. So don't even, even look at it. But there's usually some place in there that you can fit yourself, like mm -hmm. if you can get a chance to do lunch regularly, um, you give up lunch. A, a friend of mine once said that doing anything creative is also a question of learning what you can give up. And um, you know, I am never going to be the kind of housekeeper my mother was. <laughs> <laughs> what am I giving up for writing or Lent or whatever? Yeah, cleaning, <laughs> cleaning. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm he, down with he that. He does the cleaning. I'm done with that. I'm giving up cleaning. So. 
<laughs> I wish you just said, we're married, by the way, so it's not like he just randomly comes to my house to clean it. <laughs> <laughs> Though if he did, we'd pay him. Yes. Yeah, are you for hire? Hey, that's a new business. <laughs> no, no, okay, so how do, I, how do I find the time? I have a, I have a very, very demanding job, um, but... It's one where I, I travel a lot. So I'm a, I'm a pilot for the Marine Corps, and right here, part of the reason I, I do what I do at Congress is I, I travel a lot with the members. And so I don't have a regular schedule every day where I can plan on what I'm doing. And quite frankly, sometimes I just get home, and the last thing I want to do is write. And I want to see my kids, and I want to watch an episode of Elementary with my husband, you know, and then I have my night to cook, you know, all these things. So how I find time is I am a runner, um, I love marathons, all that stuff, and so typically I'll run in the morning, but I don't run every day. I run two or three days a week, but I try to get up early, um, and I've not been very good at that the last couple months, um, but for example, when I was writing the third novel in this trilogy, for like three months, I got up at 5 a.m. every day, and I wrote. Um, and I did that because I was freshest in the morning. I knew that's when my creative juices were flowing the most. And why am I going to give that amazing creative energy to my job when I could give it to my writing? Because, you know, that came out really wrong. I, I, I like to we all do it that way. Yeah. At any rate, um, I just knew that I was coming home exhausted and, and had nothing left for writing. So I had to do it first thing in the morning. But the fact of the matter is, I don't have a set schedule. I beg, borrow, and steal time where I can find it. Thankfully, my daughters love my books. They <laughs> hound me for the next thing that I'm going to write. So whenever they're like, but mom, spend time, I'm like, hey, I'm writing. You said you wanted me to write. <laughs> so, um, but it also ebbs and flows. I honestly haven't written very much in the last couple months. Um, and then there was a competition that just came out that is due next week. And uh, Jean Marie was very kind enough to read a draft of mine. And so, you know, stuff like that, like uh, Lindsay, was it Lindsay? Yes. <laughs> was mentioning earlier, deadlines, you know, you, you find time. But I think as we said, it, it's, it's always, you know, stealing. You're stealing mm -hmm. from here to give up there. Our house is a wreck and I don't even apologize for it anymore. Yeah. Our house really is a wreck. Um, our bathrooms are clean though. Our bathrooms are clean because <laughs> I clean them, yes. All right, so, you know, I, it's interesting. When I was an active duty Marine, I find that I had a lot more time to write than I do now. And I, you know, it's, so we started a publishing company and I thought, hey, this is great, I'll, I'll, I'll work for myself, I can set my own hours, I'll work from home. So I'll have plenty of time to do all of the things that I always want to do. And it is completely the opposite now. I, I found that, and I was conscientious in my job. I don't want you to think that I wasn't when I was a Marine, because I was, but I find that, that I have less time to write now because I, I'm more demanding of myself, right? So, yeah, I, have, I, I, I work for myself, which basically means that I work from the time that I wake up until the time that I go to sleep, right? <laughs> there's, there's, it, there's always something else that I can be doing to grow the business. Um, so, so that that is always on the on the top of my mind. So it really does. It, this, it, and I'm reiterating what these guys have said before because they're absolutely right. It becomes a matter of stealing the time somewhere, right? And there's the the, the fact of the matter is everything that you want to do in your life, there's not going to be time to do all of that to the absolute fullest. There's not going to be time to to be proficient in every single thing that you want to do. You're going to have to take the time from something else. So you prioritize. So you prioritize. And that's really what it boils down to is prioritize. Yeah. How, how, well, how well does prioritization work in your writing environment? Everybody, I mean, it's easy to just plan what you can do, right? I'm going to write that from 2 to 6 o'clock. But that would be poison. Whether it's a.m. or p.m. Two to three. I'd like a book in a month right. if I had that. I'm going to write from two to three o'clock. That's maybe. You've got, you've got kids, you've got pets, you've got Tumblr? helicopters. Husband. You've got things going on. <laughs> Sherlock, no. Right. You've got Sherlock. Elementary. Yeah. How, do you, oh, how do you isolate that and get yourself? Focus to write because you can't write unless you're focused, right? So how, how do you? Well, 
you don't write well. <laughs> it depends on the writing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I write nonfiction. I also do uh, video interviews for something called Buzzy Magazine. It's a great magazine, by the way, online. BuzzyMagazine.com. Um, I spent 30 years uh, as a reporter and as a government writer. I can write nonfiction bleeding in the emergency room. I have done it. <laughs> so I don't have to focus for nonfiction. For fiction, I have to focus. And uh, to a certain extent, th th this is where I was getting into structure and, and all that. Um, you sometimes don't have the time to focus or to prioritize. You're just sort of slamming from one disaster to another. Uh, and Perfect. writing on the fly. Yeah. yeah, writing on the fly. And you know, when I have my choice, I'm just the opposite of you guys. My best hours are between seven and midnight at mm -hmm. night for creativity. Okay, so who, who are the night owls here? Yeah. <laughs> All right, wow. so who are the, the normal people who. <laughs> I would say that no, you have to redefine normal here. <laughs> there is some point after 10 o'clock at night where. I would be easily confused with, with one of the less uh, cognizant uh, staff or, or cast on The Walking Dead. You know? yeah. I, it, just, yeah. no. it just doesn't work for me. Although I will, I will say um, to Jean Marie's point here, um, one of the things, one of the tricks, or you know, you're talking about your structure and when you like to write, and you're talking about how do you get in. The, it sounds to me like you're asking how do you get the zone in the zone quickly. How do you, how do you get in so, writing mode? So when I first started writing my novel, um, we didn't have any kids. Um, I was a pilot, and it was a it was a squadron that didn't have a very high operational tempo. It was a, a stateside squadron where all we did was fly generals around. So. Um, and I was the most junior officer in the squadron, so my requirements were not very high. So I could come home, I could put my mood music on, it would be perfect, and right. Don't talk to me, Ron. I'm arting. <laughs> <laughs> I am arting, I cannot art. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that changed really quick, um, even before we had kids, because we moved up here, all of a sudden I had this insane job where I had to yeah, you know, this is Chairman Issa, I want to go to Moscow tonight. Ah, okay, let's go. Um, my life changed. And so what I found was I'd always listened to music while I was writing. And I became a bit like Pavlov's dogs, I guess, where when certain songs would come on or certain albums would come on, I'd be like, I need to be writing. Why am I not writing? Why am I not <laughs> So, like, I honestly, I cannot listen to Adele. I can't. Because if she comes on, like, I'm going, I need my computer or something, or somebody give me a piece of paper or a notepad. And there are a few other albums like that, like the Cranberries, Enya. So you've trained yourself. I've trained <laughs> myself particularly to certain albums and just, and I don't even listen to them. It's, they're just going somewhere in the background, but it, it's like Pavlov's dogs. So find something that's your trigger is what that's I'm getting idea. at here. What helped me to, um, when I was right, when I was drafting Secret, I would, you know, I'd get up, I'd go to work, and all throughout work, I'd be thinking, man, I just want to go home and I want to write about my psychic Russians. I want to really get back into this story. But I'd let these ideas start stewing kind of in the back of my mind. Yes. Yes. You start thinking, oh, well, wouldn't the scene be even cooler if I kind of added this element? Or, you know, what if there's the space race going on? You come up with these additional things when you're not actually at your keyboard and you're thinking about them, and they just get better on their own yeah. when you step away. So by the time you actually can sit down and get it all out of there, it's, it's so much better than you would have done if you had just had for endless time to sit down and peck away at it, I think. And, and I will admit to having had those moments walking yeah. around the corners of the Pentagon and like running back to my desk, pulling up my phone, <laughs> like, don't forget this brilliant idea. Right, right, I, I keep this all the time. Do you, do you walk around the Mental recorder going I mean, on. I mean, I, no, I, I used to have a one hour commute to work um, mm -hmm. in my car, and you know, these brilliant ideas would come while I thought they were brilliant. But, um, <laughs> brilliant ish. Brilliant ish. And so I literally put like the audio recorder going, Janine, don't forget, you, you want to write about this horrible sadistic fairy who tries to kill her in this way, in this way, in this way, but this is how she gets out, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you send yourself that message, and then you get home, and you're like, why did I think that was cool? <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes you're like, yeah, that was cool! I'm glad I saved that. Well, on that note, when you're, 
So you only get a, a little bit of time to write because you have you lead a busy life. Right. So you, how do you keep track of what you're doing? Do you have a, an overall outline of what you're going to do? I do, or do you kind of okay? I ended here. I'm going to start at this point, or. Or, or, or are you more all over the place and then kind of put it together? What, what would be a good strategy so, for somebody? So Janine is much more organized than I am. Um, I, almost anybody is much, I think Pigpen is much more organized than I am. <laughs> but I, uh, so my, what I generally do is I, I and I, I will freely admit, I pretty much just vomit on the page initially, right? And, I, and then I massage it. I mean, I, I well, but metaphorically. I vomit on the page, and then I massage it. And when I have to, when I have to break off, <laughs> when I have to that's break something off, you want to touch with your bare hands. No, not really. When I, when I have to break off, I, I come back and I reread the last little bit of what I wrote to get me back into an understanding of where I was. Now I, I'm lucky in that I naturally compartmentalize very well, right? I I don't naturally organize very well, but I naturally compartmentalize very well. Um, and so I can, when I focus on something, I am completely focused on it. So I can do that switch off where I, you know, I can switch off whatever I was doing before and go do something else and then switch it back on. Mm -hmm. So what, for the aspiring writers out there, um, and for people who work, you know, like myself and are busy and just don't have the time to put stuff together, what do you think would be the, the number one tip you have for the aspiring writer. Well, first of all, stop calling busy. yourself an aspiring writer. Yeah, very true. And stop saying you don't have time. I don't have time. I, I guarantee you. My <laughs> friend Brian Young runs a motion picture company. He also works for the city of Salt Lake City. And he puts out something like two, at least two novels a year and has two kids. He's basically the busiest man I know. And there, there, there's, if he can find the time, and he play, and he's not like a, he is actively involved in his children's lives. Yeah. Um, you can find the time. It's, you have to give stuff up. I mean, I, I have one TV show. I watch elementary, and that's it. That's cool. I don't watch, but I don't watch anything else. I don't have time yeah. because I want to write, and I want to be with my kids. I don't play video games. Monday night, I never write on Monday night because Monday night is family night, and that's the, the night where we get together as a family, and we play rock band together, or we play Django together, or something. Friday night is date night, no matter what. I don't write Friday night, because he and I go out on a date, on date night. But pretty much every other night of the week, oh, that's mine. That's my writing time. It's, it's, all, about, it's all about the things you have to give up, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. And, you know, people, I don't think most people realize how much time they spend on things that are not productive in their lives. I think if you sit down, if you sit down and you just go through a week of your life, and every time you change an, an activity that you're doing, you make a note of it and what it is that you're doing, I think you'll find that there is a lot of time in there that you have not been properly accounting for, right? I mean, I know, I know I do it. I know that there is massive amounts of time that I, that I waste, basically. Um, and I think that's true for all of us. And so I, there's, there's time to be reclaimed there. Right, you yeah. Just figure out where it is. Well, there's time to be reclaimed if you could actually reclaim the time. A lot of the things that drive me insane that are things that are commitments I cannot uh, yeah, divest myself of. You can say no to stuff. You can say no. To <laughs> no, you cannot say no to the person who's got a who's just been sent to the hospital and has an impossible situation yes, at home you can't and an impossible up. situation at work. No, you're going to spend two hours on the phone letting her, letting her vent on you. Yeah. Um, but having said that, having said that, you know, you do need to examine what you've got and see where you, you know, what you can give up for Lent. It may not be much. But the other thing is there is a philosophy of writing called, uh, and it's not going to be very polite, stew and spew, which is sort of what you've been talking about, where your, you know, your brain is engaged in um, mechanical tasks, mm -hmm. and you can basically divest yourself of and let the plot bunnies uh, play, and uh, have something at hand that will allow you to take a note, whether it be your phone, whether it be a recorder, whether it be pencil and paper. 
uh, so that you can keep track of that stuff. And then try to put together some time where you can actually look at this. Uh, also, if you have some sort of athletic event that you do routinely, you run, mm -hmm. I walk, I do exercises. Um, and God, the best place to get your ideas, in a, your ducks in a row, the shower. It's so true. Oh, God. It's so true, because you're distracted. The shower. <laughs> and basically, you know, pull those things together bit by bit by bit by bit. And then eventually when you can, when the person who is ill gets better and you don't have to spend that two hours a day on the phone with them, when the spouse is busy away at his convention, because my husband's an artist, and boy, you think I'm crazy getting ready for a con. You should see him. Uh, you know, when the cat is actually asleep, um, and he does sleep occasionally, uh, that you've got all of these little pieces that suddenly you can put together, and you can be much more productive in the time you have. I think he had a question. Uh, I sure. did. Um, so to dovetail on what you were saying for a piece of it and to change the direction just a tad, once you start to find the time, how do you find the motivation, particularly for those of us who have jobs in which we spend the entire day looking at a screen? <laughs> so writing implies giving up going outside, doing other things to continue to spend more time looking at a screen. What, where do you find the motivation to actually do so in that moment? My friend Brian that I mentioned before actually writes a hand written, he writes his first drafts frequently that way. Can you repeat the questions from your Sure. Um, he was wondering, where do you find the motivation to write? The energy level. The energy level. <laughs> to, to look at a screen if again. If you're already staring at a screen all day, to look at a screen again. Well, and beyond even that, as you say, just the energy level of when, when you don't have it. They aren't screaming in your head to get out? <laughs> I, th I think it's important sometimes if you give yourself a little buffer to because, yeah, I was staring at the screen, especially if you write on a screen and you work on a screen, you're, you're going to get tired. Your eyes are going to get tired and your brain's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. You have to give yourself time to decompress, and that's when you can recharge the well a little bit. We're not saying, you know, you have to go out and cancel your t cable mm -hmm. subscription or anything, because it is important to recharge. Um, so build in some time. For me, that's on the Metro ride home. I like to read on that. Or I check my email, um, you know, watch, watch a show that I've missed, something like that. And that gives me a little bit of time to decompress, come home, have dinner, and then it's time to get back to work once you're feeling a little revitalized. Because if you're only giving and giving and giving of yourself, then yeah, you're, never, you're going to run dry. You're not going to have that energy that you need. Yeah, there's only so much creative energy in a given day and a certain amount of it is going to be given to your job because, well, rent and mortgages are good. Um, and uh, there's going to be a certain amount that you have to give to your loved ones and don't regret that in any way, shape, or form, whether it's, you know, Monday night, family night, or however you, you structure that. You do need a break, uh, but yeah, I find that they are screaming, mm -hmm. you know, they're noisy. Yeah. You, just need a, you just need a buffer. You know, for me, that buffer that is running just as it is for her, right? I mean, it's, I get out, I run, it's a mechanical action, my brain clears. No one's allowed to call. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. No, I'm not talking to somebody on the phone, I'm not staring at a phone screen or a computer screen. I'm not, you know, and it gives me that buffer between all of that other stuff and what I want to do. Well, my question, you can talk about compartmentalizing your time and, and prioritization and, and setting aside time and the motivation and energy level. So. Once you sit down and that clock's ticking and you know you've got that hour to write in, how do you turn off that clock in your mind that says, okay, I've only got 60 minutes? The question how is, stay, how, how do you, do you turn off your clock? Yeah, how do you stay in the moment? So you finally have that time to write. How do you stay focused just on that without worrying about everywhere else you should be or should have done or what's coming up next? For me, so I'm obsessed with time. Um, <laughs> I, I'm obsessed with how many hours of sleep I get. I'm obsessed with how many hours I spend doing X, Y, or Z. I don't know why. I guess I'm just a crazy person, but I'm obsessed. And I am that person who looks and goes, oh my gosh, I only have 45 minutes to write. I need to get out, however many words. And honestly, the only way I got over it is I just said, get over it. I mean, like, I just had to train myself to get over it. Because either I could sit there and panic and stare at the screen and not do anything and watch as the time click by, or I could just 
utilize the time that I had. And so one thing that I do is, um, one of the best tricks I was ever told was by a, a dear friend of mine, Aaron Austin, um, when I was asking him what process he goes through, um, he told me what he does is he sits down and he reads everything he wrote the previous two days. And by doing that, um, it'll get him into, so he, he reads the first couple, he reads the last few chapters he's written. And it will, by doing that, it gets, he edits everything, so he catches typos and things that maybe need to get changed. And then it gets him warmed up and enough and ready to just hit the ground running when he gets to the new content he needs to write. So that's what I do. Um, and it helps. And then I also try to never stop writing at the end of a chapter because I found facing the beginning of a new chapter upon starting on a new day is almost as daunting as starting a new book or a new story. What so, if it overlaps on your, on your scheduled time? What well, um, I mean, also, I'll, I've ended early before. If I go, oh, I'm nearing the end of this chapter, and I know that I'm feeling the momentum, but I know I'll pick up the momentum again tomorrow because I know, I know myself, and I know facing that, oh, chapter 12, Winking cursor. And, <laughs> so I'd rather do it while I have momentum. And Gail's laughing. I don't know. Do you, do you face that too, Gail? I think everybody does. Yeah. yeah. It's daunting. So, so you're structured, but you have to give yourself a little bit of flexibility. you got to be flexible. And honestly, for me, it ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'll be pretty manic about writing, and my family knows, okay, for the next month, we're just not talking to mom. But then, like, for the last couple of months, I really, I really haven't written anything. Um, part of that was, you know, as I mentioned, Aaron, Aaron passed away and he and I were in a, it, we were doing like four different projects together. So part of it was, I, I just feel very lost and adrift right now. Like, um, but part of it was, I just haven't, I just, I'm tired. I need a break. I need a break from writing. So I was running more. Yeah. I, and I think so, I think so many of us put so much pressure on ourselves about everything that we do, whether it's writing or it's your job that's your daily job or whatever. And I think part of, a big part of this is to, to realize it's in life or death. You know, I'm, a, a deadline's an important thing. Don't let me tell you a deadline's not an important thing. As a publisher, a deadline's an important thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Nothing pisses your ass <laughs> No, no, it's true. But you know what? It, it's not life and death, right? This is, this is publishing. It's writing. It's... it's I, uh, an example. So I had, I had, uh, we had a, a book order the other day that we ordered from a printer, and it went massively wrong. The books arrived uh, to the tune of two to three hundred books, and they were just they were just the advanced copies. They were, and they were all they were all kinds of screwed up. And uh, and we called the printer, and the printer was like, "Yep, yeah, that's the the file you sent me was messed up, and and so it's not my fault. So you know, you're out that." Fifteen hundred dollars or whatever it was, it's coming out of your pocket, right? And uh, and and I, the 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 my editor and and layout person who was responsible for that was going crazy. She was like, "Oh my gosh, I, I you know, you guys are going to fire me. I'll, this is horrible. I'll pay you back I'll pay for you back it. I'm so money. sorry. I'm so sorry." And I called her up and I said, "Hey, listen, nobody died here." Your kids are alive. My kids are alive. We're going to get up tomorrow morning, and we're going to be able to go back to work. This is not life or death. It's just money, right? We're going to recover from this. This is fine. And it's not, you know, it's we're going to live. And and I think if you take that attitude and you realize... By the way, I'd like to point out he did end up going up the management chain and got them to say we're sorry, and they reimbursed us and are doing the best. So. <laughs> yes, I just no, want to I, know that he didn't just leave it at that. No, I ultimately <laughs> worked my way up the, 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 the publishing, the printing chain until I got somebody who knew, um, what, they were knew what they were talking about and, and we didn't wind up having to pay for the books, which made all of us happy, except for maybe the print. But... <laughs> But my point was, even when we thought that it was a catastrophic thing, it's not a ca catastrophic thing. You know, nobody's nobody's gonna Your be destroyed in the hospital by this. Is that's more catastrophic. More catastrophic. Yeah. Yes, that's... that is more important, right? That is more catastrophic. So don't put too much pressure on yourself about this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Do you? Um, and I actually wanted to ask you about publishing. And you guys are writers, and you're busy. You're not a not. You're not nine to five writers, right? So, when you make a, a deal with a publisher or a book deal, um, is are the dates 
spread out more? Are they expecting less of you, or is it just depends. all straight out negotiable? It very much depends. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I the situation. Yeah, I, I've known folks who have major New York deals who basically had deadlines, and you probably a hard, firm deadline for the delivery of the manuscript. And then the editor sits on it for a year. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> but you're stuck for that hard, firm deadline. And then, by the same token, I've known people who uh, basically, uh, you come to a deadline, you're cramming to the deadline, and suddenly they go, hey, um, you know that short story? Well, they push back the due date, so you got another month or two. And you're going, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's like the best email in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's just the greatest email. Hallelujah, at the bottom of my you got two more months to live. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it can be really hard. And then I remember, uh, I don't know, Mindy Klasky, is she here at the con? Well, anyway, so. there's this yeah. wonderful writer, fantasy, romance, Mindy Klasky. And she once was came up for her first book. She turned in her first book already written. And they said, so when are you going to have the next book done for us? And she's going, by virtue of that first book, two years? They said, raw answer. <laughs> Ouch. I don't know. My publish is always very reasonable with me. So. Oh, gee, yeah. <laughs> wonder why. <laughs> We're going to take some questions from the audience for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Matt? Have you dealt with friends or family who don't understand being a writer and don't understand that this is its own job in and of itself? I'm going to repeat the and, question. And how have you dealt with that? How have you handled it? Uh, yeah, do you, would you mind going up to the mic and, and repeat oh, it? Yeah, sure. No problem. That way everybody can hear. If you want to speak after, I'll just kind of line up behind. Have you dealt with friends or family who don't understand being a writer, don't understand that this is just as much a job as your full-time jobs, and if so, what have you done to work with those situations in your lives? Oh, it's definitely a challenge. I've found that it, it, it got easier once I had a publishing deal and could say, oh, I'm going to be a real author, see, this is actually worth all the time, but it's hard when you're fighting that road. But I think your true friends will understand why that's a priority to you, why it matters to you. And I'm sure they have something as well that's just as important to them. Um, it's, it's just being able to communicate it. And then also being honest with yourself about, if I'm going to be setting aside this time to write, then when I'm not doing that, I can't feel guilty about not working on it. I have to step away from the writing entirely, spend time with my friends, spend time with my loved ones, and commit fully to the time that I do spend with them so that when I'm writing, I can commit fully to that. What she said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say that it can be difficult. I'm older than everybody on this panel. I can, I'm probably older than all of them put together. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> I'm really old too. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, okay, everybody but Ron. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is, if you have older parents, it's not so much of a problem usually with your friends, because your friends are your friends because they put up with you. Mm -hmm. Um, family members get a little bit dicier. Uh, Why are you traveling to this con instead of seeing me? Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Well, uh, no, my mother was great for, Why can't you call your Aunt Rita and write the speech for your cousin? Oh, It'll only take you 15 minutes. <laughs> And well, you aren't visiting me enough? Yeah. Well, there's some folks you're just never going to be able to convince. Hopefully you're not married to them. I, I, you know, I have not had to deal with that, but I have known marriages that have broken up over this because one partner does not see the validity of another partner's activities. I have not had to deal with that. But with my parents it was always because they were like, they were 40-something when they had me. And it was a large measure of sucking it up and staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning instead of going to bed at 11. Mm. It's, it's got to be pretty hard, um, oh, especially yeah. when you guys are already super busy. <laughs> yeah. Then you have, why don't you come and visit me? You know? Well, it's not just the why don't you come and visit me, it's the, you know, the call in the middle of your writing time going, oh, yeah. I need you to do this now. But you, you learn stuff. Like uh, my parents have been bugging us to fly out because they live on the West Coast to come see them. And I went, well, I just 
I, I just found out I'm a guest at San Diego Comic Con, so guess when we're coming to see you? <laughs> <laughs> I hope yeah. you're free the last week of July. <laughs> and yeah, you, you find ways. You find ways to make it work. Although, like you said, some people never will. My my parents. I, I, I was I went down and visited my parents a couple of weeks ago, actually, first time in I don't know a year and a half or something, and uh, and. My parents gave me the, you know, why don't you come see us more thing out of one side, and then my dad out of the other side was like, hey, you know, I've just written a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get some of that too. Can you help me? Yeah. I've got this great idea for a book. Why don't you write it? Why don't you it? write it? <laughs> why don't you write it? <laughs> yes. I think she has a question. Yes, next question. Um, this is a very specific part, part motivation question. For those of you who do research, like the historical mm -hmm. nonfiction, um, I try to figure out a way to budget it, but I always feel guilty of giving up my writing time to research, but you can't do the writing to so research. Actually, right. let me, everybody research. You research for everything that you write, everything that you write. I don't care if it's some crazy paranormal fantasy that happens on Mars. <laughs> You research everything you write. I mean, in, in this book, I had the sun rising in the south at one point. For some reason, I can't remember why. Um, but I still took the time. I sent it to my friend who's an astronomer and for NASA and was like, Could this? I know this is a world with magic and stuff like that, but I still want like basic physics to be real. You know, uh, could this happen? And so she, she spent a lot of time researching it, but I would never written a fairy tale either. I spent a considerable amount of time just researching basic Celtic fairy tales. So honestly, anytime you're world building, which is what you do when you tell a story, you're gonna research. Yeah, and, there, and, you're gonna spend, and you're gonna spend a lot of time researching and never begrudge yourself that. <laughs> there's, a good, there's a good reason for that, and a couple of good reasons. And the, they, they are, people are willing to suspend disbelief on some supernatural things as long as everything else works, number one. And number two, people are willing to suspend disbelief on the supernatural stuff as long as your system works within itself and is consistent. I mean, right? how many of us watched Captain America 2? Thought it was great, except for the part where he runs in front of the Lincoln Memorial and you're like, yeah, because like that always happens where no one's there. <laughs> I'm fine with everything else. <laughs> in that movie, but that, nope, nope, sorry, <laughs> ruined it, no, didn't ruin it, but come on, like immediately threw me out of the movie. Oh yeah, how many, uh, for all of us, how many of us have read a book set in Washington, oh, D.C.? Yeah, it's uh, painful. And it took me 15 minutes to get from here to there. Or where they've it, got like... like next door? <laughs> yes. Or, or, or the metro in Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, that would take you like two seconds to research. Oh, what's the metro stop in Georgia? Oh, there isn't one. Okay, my <laughs> character's riding the bus. It is or running. You got it. Research, you got to do it. Is your question more to balancing the research time versus the writing time? Um, what's the best way you found to do it but not sacrifice your productivity in your limited time? Right. Well, if you know, if you're working on a project, but you know your next project, man, I would just, I would really love to write something set in North Korea. And I'm, I'm writing this book that's, you know, a completely second world fantasy right now. Start early, you know, start thinking about it and let those ideas stew for a bit and start reading ahead for that while you're finishing up whatever other edits or other priorities that you have. Um, that way you can kind of overlap a little and start getting the ideas stewing before you actually have to start writing it. It, it, it can be complicated because sometimes, you know, the, the standard way of cutting your research time is to write your story first in the vomit draft, as Ron called it, uh, and then research the points that you don't know. The problem is sometimes yeah. to put the story together, you need the research. So I, world yeah, world. but you don't have to necessarily do all of your research at once. You can start slow and you know have it. But I mean, I, I'm doing something set in 1814, the burning of Washington. And yeah, I did exactly what you said. I was researching last October for something I'm writing now, but as I'm writing it in the middle of it, it's like, ooh, I need this. Yeah. And yeah. There, you're gonna find those moments. And the, the other thing that doing that, uh, the other good thing that doing that does is it keeps you, so you're, you are then reading something that is not in the genre that you are writing. That does help, right? yeah. And you don't want to do that. You don't, do not want to be reading Lord of the Rings while you're writing epic fantasy. Because you're going to come out sounding like Tolkien. 
right? I was writing something once that was like a coming of age type of story, and I was reading, I, I was reading Huckleberry Finn at the time, and I swear I sound exactly like Mark Twain. Well, and like Aaron even called you out on it. He read your yeah. draft and was like, "So you've been reading Twain?" <laughs> yeah. That's definitely something. Hi, sir. My question is, um, it's an expansion on the prioritization. How do you prioritize, or give me some tips on prioritizing projects? I have like three short stories at different, very, at different stages of completion, and I want to expand one that, that I've written into a novel. And I have them sitting around my home office. I get fantastic ideas for one, write them down, scribble them down, put them in the folder. But I'll have been sitting down trying to work on something else when those ideas will hit me. So, any tips on prioritizing projects? Oh man, I, I always have more ideas than I have time to write. So I just, I do, I have a notebook that I keep them all in. Um, and I just, as I can think of ways to expand them, then I keep track of that. But um, you're, if you are lucky enough to be under deadline or have a contract for something, obviously that comes first. Yep. That's your number one priority. And the thing I've learned with deadlines too, is if you're usually early for them most of the time, they will be more understanding if you have to be late one time. Um, so if that helps too with how to um, how to, how to get that time out, but um, maybe uh, your favorite story out of the how do you prioritize which story to write? I go to the one that I feel the most the needs to come out. So first, I prioritize by what to do. Yeah. Um, and so before I was published, obviously that was not something I could use. But now I definitely have for the next year due dates of different things that are due. <laughs> But then when that's not an issue, um, I go with what I'm feeling pulled to the most. Mm -hmm. and because there's nothing worse right than now. writing something you really don't feel like writing. Right and now. you'll know once you get going, yeah. you're like, oh, this, this idea really isn't ready. I think I should yeah. work on something else. Yeah. It needs to stew a bit more. Yeah. yeah. So that's how. And you just don't let yourself jump from that too much once you... Yeah. Uh, go with the momentum. Go with the momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in regards to sort of writing other worlds and creating sort of your own fantasy space with its own rules and everything, um, how do you go about planning or mapping out the rules of the world and the different sort of things that are going on? Because that's something that I always struggle with, especially when you're trying to write like a fantasy world or something like that. Um, it's really hard to sort of sit down and say, okay, what have I covered? What have I said is true? What haven't I talked about? Because there's all those little pitfalls and continuity areas you could have if you don't have an explanation for them. So that's where beta readers are awesome. No, so I, I, I actually, so I wrote a trilogy and I actually did write a Bible um, where I outlined, because I had multiple different races and then I had my elves which had 12 different tribes and each tribe has a very unique personality and the way they dress and talk and look. Um, so I actually wrote it all out like like a textbook. It was huge. And I ended up actually paring it down and putting it at the back of the final book in my trilogy because I had a lot of people asking me for it. Um, and a lot of this stuff never made it into the novels, but it was stuff I had to know. Um, as far as continuity, I had several beta readers, and one of them's back there, and, and she, you know, these, these people were wonderful, and they would ask me, like, well, whatever happened to this guy? You know, you just kind of left his story dangling. Oh, crap, I better tie that up. You know, um, really, that's, I know, like, for example, Rowling, specifically, there was one person whose entire job was continuity, like, throughout all seven books. Yeah. Seven big books, yeah. Seven big books. Usually um, copy editors will cover this, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, but I, I try to type, tie it up as much as I could before sure. I turned it in. So you're going to have people, you're going you're gonna to build throughout the course of your writing networks of people. Um, like, like Jean Marie got my, my first nonfiction piece, or my second nonfiction piece that I was doing um, for this contest that I'm submitting to. Because she's someone that I trust and I've known her long enough that I, I feel like it's not this huge, horrible thing for me to ask her to take a look at it. And I feel like she'd feel comfortable enough to send it yeah. to me. Same with, you know, Gail, same with Tanya. And, you know, we have these relationships where, hey, I'm too busy right now, I can't look at it, but send me something next time, you know, maybe I'll help you out. And so you work with people and you read stuff for them, they read stuff for you, and, and you give each other honest feedback. Not mean, but honest. And there's all, this is in a weird way a research question. Most fantasies, even epic fantasies, are based on history. And there is a historical model for something. Gail was talking about this in the last uh, panel, about how you look at a historical model for what you want to do 
and then you mess it up. But if you, if you have something that, that speaks to you in terms of your world, you know, like, well, I'm going to base this part of my society on Renaissance Italy, and that part on um, the revolutionary politics of uh, France in the 18th century. Basically, you can get your details and your continuity by looking at these models. And then, then you've got something that you can work on that your beta readers can take over. <laughs>